Hello, I'm Dave Hi. Kowalski. And I'm Nick Rado. Nice Hi. to meet you. Likewise. And of course, I'm Aldra. <laughs> it's Otis. Well, one thing we noticed as we were looking at your work and mm -hmm. your exhibition that you have right now is the huge variety of materials and the styles that you've worked into your creations mm -hmm. over your whole career. Could you talk a little bit about how you work as a ball? I, I was a figurative painter, um, but I think I mentioned earlier I have always utilized geometry, and I never was certain why that geometry was an encasement. I mean, obviously you have the rectangle of the canvas to begin with, but I would incorporate circles, or I would create these flaps that seemingly, I would paint in a flap that you're lifting to reveal another reality. It's almost like uh, instinctively knowing that what you see is not all there is that there, there are worlds beyond worlds. And this was purely instinctive. In fact, I had a professor once at college who said to me, nobody paints in pink and blue. Well, I have always painted in pink and blue. Well, Mozart had his pink period and blue period, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it has reached almost pure abstraction now, but I feel some of the symbols that I use, there is a shape that is like this, but this shape I call womb wound. And these womb wound symbols were from a series I did about sensitization or desensitization. And I was asking myself the question when our children were young, how does one become a sensitive being? Or how does one become desensitized? and what are the, all those factors. So all that is like this backlog that kind of haunts me and is ever present in the evolution of the work. So it has changed as my symbols have become more pure. And even when we didn't, we were looking through her exhibit, we didn't realize it was, it was all the same person at first. Um, we, we did start to pick up on some of the themes that mm -hmm. were running throughout. It was kind of subliminal, subliminal. Yeah. but over time, we started to see the connections between what you had incorporated. Yeah. Well, I think so many people want titles. What I have done in the past is I don't title anything, and I make out a list of titles, which are basically not titles, they're philosophical ruminations about meaning of life or the relationship between physics and or abstraction or these energy patterns, which is what my work is about now. And hope that because people cannot just label something and ignore it and say, oh, that's what it is, that they have to spend time with the art and think of or absorb it and allow the art to work on them so thereby the art communicates whatever it's possible to communicate. One, one thing I thought was really nice about um, the way you were using titles was, was that they were almost anti-titles. Um, rather yeah. than just right. telling us exactly what it is, they made us ask even more questions. How yeah. does it relate to the work? What does she mean exactly by yeah, it? I love using words and I love doing the art and that uh, relationship or the feasibility of making a connection that hasn't been identified that is more in the form of a question that you find your own answer in it is, I feel, the most mean meaningful way for an audience to experience something. We did, we did start to piece together that we like we were taking guesses as to what your philosophy and certain things were just yeah. based I, on. I had assumed pantheism. <laughs> I, I was sure of it from a quote. It, it looks like a quote from Augustine or maybe Anselm. Well, one thing that me and uh, Nick and I had noticed off the bat was your very mathematically influenced work. Yeah. And uh, do you want to? I was going to mention how. Oh, yeah. I actually brought some um, mathematical drawings that I'd done. Oh. There are um, two fractals. One is the dragon curve and the other is just one that I drew in my free time. Well, you had mentioned previously how 
you just kind of stumbled across a lot of this. You weren't necessarily, for a lot of them, trying to do yeah. a particular yeah. um, well, effect with it. Well, this is beautiful. Do you know Mondrian? The work of Mondrian? No. He's a very ge uh, minimal geometric painter. And at that time, when people were writing books about him, they said he's a minimalist. He is, it's just about pure geometry. And lo and behold, I, well, I had read something other about Mondrian's spirituality and that he was a spiritual seeker and he, and in a way, encoded spirituality into his geometry. And for me, my geometry is a symbol. It's not, I, it's not mathematical. And so it, whatever I sensed about Mondrian, it turned out to be true. He was a spiritualist and he arrived at the geometry as a result of the spiritual seeking. And somehow it automatically speaks to you. That's really beautiful. You can have it if you want. I actually oh. have a second one at home. Oh, thank you. Nick, do you want to sign it? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have the pen. <laughs> one goes through artists. It's like you glean whatever you can. There were, were two Italian artists, Clemente and Mimo Palladino, that maybe ten years ago I was absolutely enamored of. But I think I learned what I could from them, and so I still find them incredible. But I look for art that challenges me, that I don't understand, that uh, I can sink my teeth or whatever my being into and learn something from. And I wish I wish more people would take that attitude with anything. You know, yeah. a lot of people get kind of comfortable in a zone with something and they're too afraid to explore maybe music. Or just any sort of art in general, even life experiences. Exactly, and I mean, I think asking a question is the way to live life. Well, we had noticed the music theme throughout your work, too. She did mention that, um, that she was interested in the shape of the violin, mm -hmm. um, that it was sort of organic, wasn't it? Yeah. Do you think that was a precursor to kind of what you're doing now? That well, I, again, you know, like I've said, so much of what I transmit now is cumulatively every experience of my life. And when I was young, I used to play the accordion, the piano, I sang the or I played the organ in church and I sang mass in, in the morning, not on Sundays because my voice wasn't that good. It was daily mass. Uh, but I was in, when I was in high school, I was in a very bad car accident. And after I kind of started to heal, I, it was just when I was graduating, so it was a transitional moment. And I wasn't doing my music. I was getting, I was befuddled and going to college. And once I entered the arena of trying to play these instruments, nothing happened. And what was amazing to me is no one realized that I had lost this ability. And, but I do remember walking into uh, the physics class and seeing the periodic table of elements and feeling like I, I should know that. I used to know that. And I couldn't reach it. But because it was so close to graduation time, it I never... Uh, you know, no one ever picked up on the dilemma of this. And so I seemed normal, but I had lost something that was very much part of my being. Now, you were born in Lithuania. Mm -hmm. How long were you in there? Well, we left when I was three, but oh. we left because the Russians were invading. It was during the war. I mean, the Nazis were there as well. Was uh, my father was going to be conscripted by uh, I think the intelligence. The signal was that the Russians are coming to buy your house, which meant either you complied or you were shipped off to Siberia. 
So my parents decided to escape. They saddled up on horse and buggy. I mean, it's hard to imagine there were, I mean, there were cars, but uh, uh, Lithuania was an agrarian country, so this was what was available and made made a kind of year-long journey of escape, hiding out in forests. Once they got into German, crossing the lines, a lot of their friends lost their lives in minefields. But it, once they entered Germany, I mean, this is irrespective of whatever the Nazi Holocaust was, that German farmers would allow these refugees to sleep in their barns or, um, as my mother relates, one family actually invited them in to take a bath and it was so beautiful after not bathing for a year. I mean, these were, my father had been very high up on the educational system in Lithuania and my mother also taught in a college and to be reduced to this kind of beggar existence. Then they lived in Germany in a displaced persons camp when the Allies set up these camps for six years looking for someone to sponsor them to um, either come to the States or to Australia or wherever. So we ended up in DeKalb, Illinois. Do you remember anything about that time at all? Well, because I have amnesia, oh, I don't. Yeah. I have this, and I only realized I had amnesia when I met my husband because he talked so much about his past, and I realized I had no past. I mean, what my parents had told me, I newly relearned, but if you don't know what you don't know, so I didn't know I didn't know. Yeah. It's just whatever was in me, but obviously I was functional in terms of learning new things. I went to college. I got my degree and was capable of absorbing all of this, but I, and I said, it just was this total blank, and I realized all that I knew was what had been given to me subsequently. Also, the fact that we lived in DeKalb and there were no other Lithuanians, and I had been told that my name, um, Audra, would be socially unacceptable by the aunt who had sponsored us. So I was in this no man's land. I Subsequently, I reclaimed my name, and I realized this Audrey was someone that was so alien to me. And so I'm, I'm not sure what the reasons were. It's like I was living in a state of oblivion and my art being my solace, connected link. I read a lot, I was very shy, and they were my two realities. Miss Skodas was such a fascinating person to interview that it was really hard to edit down her thoughts just for the video. If you want to hear the whole half an hour interview we conducted with her, please click on the link on the screen or down below in the doobly-doo to hear her thoughts on the elongated hands that appear throughout her work, religion, Salvador Dali, and so much more. I highly recommend you give it a listen. Thank you.